you are like me, you are inundated with things telling you how to be happy. You hear it everywhere you look, even silly little Facebook quotes that you get sent from your friends seem to always be from Albert Einstein or Bob Marley or somebody telling you how to be happy. Well, I'm sick of it, and I don't know, maybe some of you are too. So I decided today that I would teach you how to be unhappy. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, why do I need to hear a talk about how to be unhappy? I'm really good at that already. <laughs> well, that might be true, but there is always room to improve or disimprove, as the case may be. I'm going to give this to you in three easy steps. The first step is, how, is living in the past or living in the future. So let's start with living in the past. The key here is avoiding this moment. This moment, this present moment, is where we experience joy, love, and many good, good, the great things in our lives. So you want to avoid that moment. One way to avoid it is to live your life in the past. Now, the past uh, is tricky or helpful for us in becoming unhappy because you can't do anything about it. We, might, we have two ways of thinking about living in the past. One is regret. Uh, we can call this, if only. If only I had not done such and such a thing in my life, then I would be happy. And the key for this is that this if only living works because you get stuck, because you can't do anything about it. In fact, that action you took that you regret, you may be right to regret it. In fact, you maybe really should be ashamed of it. It's something you did that was wrong that made a big difference for the worse in the world. But because you can't do anything about it, you should focus on it all the time. Don't think about anything else, possibilities. Think about that moment and just savor it in your unhappiness. Now, the other way you might have this if only kind of living is if only other people. If only I was born into a family that was richer, better looking. I don't know. My parents were very hot. So, <laughs> but maybe you, you know, if, if only I had parents that were nicer to me. If only I, whatever. Now, the reason this works as well is because you can't do anything about that either. You can't do anything about who, which family you were born into. So focus on that all the time. American psychology is pretty good at this. You go in to see a therapist, and they talk to you tons about your family and how your parents treated you. And if your parents just would have been nice enough to you, you would have been fine. So seeing psychologists is fine as we work toward being unhappy. So living in the past... Uh, living in uh, the future is the other one. So living in the future is one that may be a little trickier to you because people always tell you don't live in the past, you know, live in the future, set goals, decide what you want to do with your life and achieve it. Well, I'm going to tell you today that this is just a sure road to unhappiness as living in the past. Now, if the past is if-only thinking, we might think of future thinking as if-then. If this happens, then I will be happy. So some of you are uh, at, at, in college, and you think, you really do because I was in your position not that long ago, if I graduate, then I will be happy. But guess what's going to happen when you graduate? <laughs> You're going to say, if I get a good job, then I'll be happy. Then you'll get a good job, and you'll say, if I get rich, then I'll be happy. Well, the trick is, there's always something more. If you achieve A, then you want to achieve B. If you achieve B, then you need to achieve C. This is, the, this is the great sort of brilliant thing about unhappiness by living in the future, is that you never get there, <laughs> right? So this kind of uh, future living is, is, is a sure road to increasing the unhappiness in your life, and, and I hope you'll do that. I'll set a goal to do that. All right. Uh, the the, the uh, next step in becoming more unhappy in your life is to be sedentary. Now, you're all doing a really good job of that right now. I feel really proud of you. Whether you're watching this on YouTube or sitting in the auditorium, you're sitting still, so you're, you're already there, so we're doing a great job. In fact, as I started reading about this, one day I read a study and it said that Americans spend more than eight hours a day in front of a screen, and I thought, are you kidding me? Who are these sickos that spend that much time in front of a screen? I can't believe they would be acting like that. In fact, I got up out of my chair from watching my screen to go tell somebody how crazy these people were. 
the irony really did hit me for a while that, of course, I had been reading about this study while sitting in front of a screen. So the screens are this wonderful thing that help increase the unhappiness in our life because they require us to sit still. Now, uh, sitting still or the sedentary life is linked uh, through recent medical research, uh, causally linked to a lot of things that can help you be less happy. Things like diabetes, uh, depression, anxiety, heart disease, all of these things are related to the sedentary lifestyle. So again, if you want to have these diseases that can help you be less happy, sit. There was a study done at Duke University uh, where they, they decided to compare exercise as an antidepressant with pills as an antidepressant, which is the more common one. And they, they did this study and they found that people who exercised, this was brisk exercise 30 minutes a day. We're not talking about marathon running, brisk walking, in other words, just walking somewhere with purpose, was, was just as effective as an antidepressant which means a lot of people don't even walk with purpose for 30 minutes a day. But anyway, uh, so the, these people that did the exercise uh, got just, did just as well as the people who are on antidepressants, and so they were equal. But even more interesting is six months later, they went for a follow-up, and the people who had exercised had a 7% relapse rate. In other words, 93% of these people were fine six months later. How about the people that took the pills? Over 30% of them had relapsed. So what that means, the lesson you can take away from this, is if you want to increase your unhappiness, you can keep taking the pills, not a problem. But just don't walk to the pharmacist <laughs> to get your pills, OK? <laughs> Especially briskly. So I had a young woman come to see me in my office recently. And, and she complained of being chronically unhappy, which I'm trying to teach you uh, to do today. And she said, I don't feel like I have any reason for waking up in the morning. And uh, so I, I began talking about the things I typically talk to people about. I talked about her nutrition. You know, what are you eating and when are you eating? It was terrible, but she was eating. Uh, how about sleep? Are you sleeping well? Do you go to sleep at certain times and wake up at certain times? Terrible also. Stayed up really late at night, slept in, missed all of her classes. And uh, the third uh, exercise, and she said, of course, which most of us, our excuse is, I just feel too lethargic to exercise. So I just couldn't, I had a hard time knowing what to do. So I just moved on to this question of, do I have a reason for waking up in the morning? And I said, well, I get that maybe you don't have a reason for waking up in the morning, but I have a solution for you. Because just yesterday, I've been talking to a person in the community who ran uh, an elderly care center. And they said, what we need is just some young people to come in and sit with them and talk. Ask them about themselves, tell stories, tell them about you, what is going on in your life. So I said, why don't you go do that? She said, I don't like old people. I said, well, actually, that's not the point of community service. It's for them, not for you. So I don't care whether you like old people or not, go. She said, well, I don't have a car to get there. I said, oh, this is so perfect. You can walk <laughs> briskly and go help these older elderly people, and then it'll be better. She decided that she wanted to continue living her unhappy lifestyle. So she's a great example to emulate. Don't do anything, especially move. Now, you might think that you like your active lifestyle. You might think, I like exercising. I like doing sports. But think of all that you can do while sitting in front of a screen. Video games, television, movies, internet stuff. I mean, there's just everything available to you. And you don't have to move at all. Just sit. Right? And in fact, if you want a double dose of this, try Facebook. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. <laughs> but Facebook is remarkable because there was a study done in, in last year in France uh, where the amount of hours, the more hours people spent on Facebook, predicted life dissatisfaction. Or if we could put it in the terms of what we're talking today, the more time you spend on Facebook, the less happy you will be. So if you want to spread this unhappiness, which I hope you do, post that on your Facebook page. <laughs> All right. So the third step that I'm going to give you today in learning how to be more unhappy is to think about yourself and really just yourself. Now, this one you might think is pretty easy especially if you're from my country. We hear this every day, all the time. In fact, I remember one of my daughters coming home from school, and she said, Dad, we sang a really strange song at school today. I was going, oh, boy, what was this? She said, it was, I love me. 
And <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, that's interesting. She said, how can I be the one loving and the one being loved at the same time? And I thought, oh, that is my girl. <laughs> so we hear about this all the time. Love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. So you've heard this before, uh, and, and I'm encouraging you to do that. Think about yourself and think about yourself a lot. In fact, when I was a teenager, there was a really famous song at the time. <laughs> it's one of those that I almost don't want to tell you about because the song will get stuck in my head now for the rest of the day. But it, was, it said, find strength in love. Can't disagree with that, right? But do you know what that love means? Or the, as, as the song says, the greatest love of all is to love yourself. This is what I mean. Love yourself, think about yourself, do what's best for you and, and, and uh, only focus on that. This puts us in a, in a kind of paradoxical situation. Viktor Frankl, a great uh, psychiatrist and survivor of the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp under the Nazis, uh, said that self-actualization, or personal happiness in a way, cannot be achieved by aiming for it. In other words, you can't set a goal to reach your you know, meaning and purpose in your life because you are not your own purpose. In other words, you're not here for you. Now, don't read Frankel, by the way, because he will clearly lead you away from the unhappiness path and, and more toward the happiness one, and I'm telling you, you really want to avoid that. You'll also want to avoid the great Indian thinker, Shanti Deva, who said, all of the suffering in the world comes from the desire for one's own happiness. Think about that. All the suffering in the world comes from the desire for one's own happiness. So what he's saying is, is if you want to be more unhappy, try to be happy. Okay? It's a great goal, right? So that's going to get you future-oriented anyway. You're miserable now, but when you graduate, you'll be happy. You're already future-oriented. And you can just focus on that a lot. Don't think about the people around you or, what, or, or the needs of the people around you. Just focus on you being happy at some future date. It, it'll be great for you, I promise. You'll, you'll be less happy, without question. Now, you may, uh, some of you may come from religious traditions that disagree with me, so let me just assure you and reassure you that it's really easy to twist those around. Let's say you follow Buddhism. Buddhism, of course, talks about reaching enlightenment, but of course reaching enlightenment so that you can help others reach enlightenment. That's what Buddha did. But you don't think about it that way. You just sort of twist Buddhism around to say, I'm going to reach enlightenment for myself, for my own reason and my own purpose. This will lead to greater and greater unhappiness. You might be a Christian, and in Christianity, uh, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So all you have to do is just turn the words around a little bit and just say, I have to learn to love myself before I can love my neighbor. Of course, that's not what he was saying, but that's beside the point. It's going to fit right in with what we're talking about. And in fact, I have heard people say that. You have to learn to love yourself before you can love others. Dozens of times, including in Christian churches. So there you go. You can be a Christian and follow what I'm teaching you to do. Uh, last of all, maybe some of you are Muslims. And uh, what you're taught in, in, in this religion, I have many Muslim friends, is to submit to the will of God. Well, just twist that around a little bit to say that God needs to submit to my will. And everybody else needs to submit to my will, too right? So you can twist things around. It's not really that difficult to move from the sort of happiness oriented toward the unhappiness oriented. Just tiny little tweaks. Uh, I have a, an experience in my own life, and, and uh, I'm not too embarrassed to tell you about it because maybe it's your story too, uh, where I would say I was in a dark time of my life, and I was doing this advice I'm giving you, I was doing it perfectly. First, I was living in the past with regrets, and if only these things had happened, if only these things wouldn't have happened, then I would be happy. So I was doing well with that. I wasn't exercising, of course, because I was too tired. I didn't have any energy. Uh, and the third, I was really, really focused on me. When I think back on that time in my life and all the people who showed love to me, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I don't think I saw them at all. And I hope they don't remember me that way, but I don't think I saw them and their lives and their issues at all. It was me. So when they came to be kind to me, I just thought, are they being kind to me? Am I happy? Am I getting what I want out of them? Well, I'm not sure exactly what the catalyst was, but at some point I decided that in these extra hours I had during the week, I would start doing volunteer work. So I got connected to a school uh, in, in the area near the university I was going to, and uh, I worked with handicapped children. Uh, ones who, uh, the, the, it was an integrated classroom, some with developmental delays and some kind of normal development children. 
and uh, I, I, I would walk in the door of the school room, and they just loved that I was there. In fact, they called me Mr. Matt, and they would just cheer every time I walked in the door. I mean, how, how does that feel, right? They're like, Mr. Matt is here, yeah. And uh, when it was time to do reading time in a little circle, uh, they figured out that if I extended my legs out, more kids could sit on my lap. So I would put my legs out, and there would be three kids on each leg as I was reading to them. My, yeah, made my legs fall asleep. But there was one little girl that I remember in particular. She was quite small, physically small of her age, but she had, she had gone through pretty severe neglect in her young childhood. And she was also mute. She never spoke. And one day as I was getting her on the school bus, she turned to me and she said, bye. One syllable is all it was. It was just, I mean, my whole life is transformed by this little girl speaking to me. Now, you might think now I'm teaching you how to be happy, but I really mean this as a cautionary tale. <laughs> if you're unhappy like was and following these rules, you really got to be careful to avoid other people and what they need. And it's not that in doing this volunteer work, I suddenly decided I'm a great person. I didn't look in the mirror and think, oh, I'm wonderful, I'm helping these children. I actually just didn't see myself anymore. I saw them. Children have a wonderful way of breaking through that barrier. I just saw the children. They saw me. And then I was done. And it wasn't because I solved the problem of whether I felt good about myself. It's that it no longer was an issue. Now, so, what you need to do then, learning from my experience, avoid that altogether. When you're miserable, when you're sitting around and not doing anything, when you're focusing on the past or some future event that's going to make your life better, uh, don't respond to the needs of other people. Just think about yourself. Some of you may be very good at this. And if you don't know whether you are or not, just ask your friends. They will tell you if you ask honestly. So, today I've given you then three simple steps. Live in the past or the future. Don't exercise, in other words, live a sedentary life, and think only about yourself. And you may imagine, and, and this is normal life, by the way, that one day you will be married to a supermodel Bollywood star in a multi-million dollar home on the beach. Trust me, this is normal life. And until you reach that, you shouldn't be happy. Thank you.